Hello, everyone. My name is Piotr Koronev, and I'm a product manager and founder at DataIDO. Welcome to our webinar in a series of webinars about the business glossaries and data dictionaries. Our speaker is George Firikan, a director uh, of data governance and business intelligence at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. He's also a public speaker and a founder of a Lights on Data blog, training and consulting. Okay, that would be it for the introduction. Over to you, George. Thank you, thank you, Piotr. Again, if you don't know me already, I can tell you that I'm very passionate about data governance and data management in general. So I'm a frequent speaker and writer, contributor and YouTuber. And as much as possible, as Piotr mentioned, I do try to provide uh, practical information to help you with your data governance and data management questions and uh, challenges. So uh, please do check out lightsondata.com where I feature some great contributors uh, as well, like Wayne here that I see on the list. Thanks for joining Wayne. And uh, if you do prefer content in video format, please check out my YouTube channel where I post a video each week or just follow me on LinkedIn and I promise you will not be disappointed. Now, if you're interested in the slides, just get in touch with me or uh, I'll send you the link or I'll be able to post them on the site. Well, we'll find a way. And yes, the recording of the webinar will be made available right after it's, uh, it's wrapped up. Okay, so let's dive right into our webinar. And I wanna start with this analogy, right? In my opinion, at least, I think there is really an ocean of data out there. And no, I'm not referring to data lakes. What I mean by a notion of data is that regardless of the organization's size or the size of the database or databases, we are confronted with a lot of challenges when it comes to data. We need different ways to navigate this ocean successfully and discover as much as we can and as much as we need to in order to answer questions to give us the insight, hindsight, and foresight to conduct the strategical and operational objectives as best as we can. And that's why we have all these data management practices and data governments in general, right? But I do think that there are these three artifacts that will help any organization navigate this ocean of data, this ocean of questions and answers on data integrations and reporting and master data management and data analytics, data governance, and so on. Just a little bit better, at least. So today, that's what I want to talk to you about, this trifecta of uh, the business glossary, data dictionary, and data catalog. We're going to find out what um, each one of them is, how they differ from one another, what their benefits are, and how they interact with uh, each other. But of course, you might have also encountered any of these other terms, a business glossary, a data vocabulary, business semantics, business catalog, um, business data dictionary, business compendium, uh, so forth and so on. All these terms, some synonyms, some not. If you're confused, I don't blame you. And not to mention any other variations like technical metadata dictionary, technical metadata glossary. Well, they don't all mean the same thing, by the way. And I'm sure there are a few other similar terms as well. And I'm actually curious to know if you've encountered any other terms now listed here that are related to these and you're confused about, you know, let me know in the questions um, at the end or right now, and we can address them. But I think out of all those terms, I think we do encounter these four the most often. And if you're like how I was a few years ago, then you might be a bit confused. Actually, I still am at times and not about the true meaning of each of these artifacts, but I'm confused when someone else refers to one of these four, but they actually mean something else. Because the truth is sometimes these terms are used interchangeably, incorrectly, of course. And um, you know, I think you might expect this from vendors, from salespeople. Though actually there's some some good vendors out there and uh, Piotr is doing a really good job at this and Data Edo as well as actually using these terminologies as it should be to their true meaning and they know which is which. And there are, again, some good vendors out there. Um, but as I was mentioning, you, you probably expect this from vendors the most often, but the truth is this also comes from consultants and data governance experts and trainers, at least from my experience they are also misusing these, some, of course, which adds to the confusion. And why I'm mentioning this is, it's completely normal for you to be confused about which is which because of it. But the idea 
is that after this webinar, it will be a bit more clear as to what the differences are and why I think it's important for you to know what the differences are. And again, no, they're not the same thing. Yes, they're all different. And so why I think it's important is that there's a high chance that you will encounter these terms in other articles and videos, if you haven't already. And knowing about all these different terms and their differences will give you a better picture on what these companies are selling, what their promises are, but you also have more clarity in the conversations with fellow colleagues and consultants and data governance experts and other organizations when the topic of any of these artifacts come into focus. In the end, you, you will be more knowledgeable. Okay, so let's continue the webinar with ensuring we have the same understanding of what we mean by a business glossary. Making assumptions on meanings of business terms such as customer, sale conversion rate, credit, GPA, you name it, is what creates certain challenges in the workplace. I remember when I was interviewing for, for a job, actually it was for a data quality manager job in a, in a nonprofit organization for which its main business role was fundraising. Now, when I was inquiring during the interview about the teams that I would be working with in my role, the interviewer told me that they have about 200 people working in development. Now, because I was coming from a software development background, my immediate reaction was, wow, 200 people working in software development? I mean, I knew it was a big organization, but I never knew they had such a large IT team. And of course, they were not referring to software development. Development is a synonym for fundraising. So they had 200 or so people working in a fundraising capacity, not in software development. And I realized that, you know, a minute or so after the, uh, the context of the conversation, but that's another story. I did get the job, by the way. The message here is that the wrong assumptions would happen and meanings of business terms are not always known, especially when you're entering a new industry, but also when you're switching organizations or even departments and not only. I bet you can ask two people in the same department what a customer is and they will give you two different definitions, especially if they don't have a business glossary in place. So again, let's get our technology straight and find out what a business glossary is. It really is a collection of business terms with their unique definitions and other useful related information. There are three keywords here, business, unique, and information. So we're talking about business terms, business language, business verbiage, whatever synonym you want to use. We're talking about having a commonplace, a trusted source of information where anyone can go to understand business terminologies and even other relevant information around these terms that provides us with a better context of their meaning and usage. A business glossary is business language focused and easily understood in any business setting from business boardroom meetings all the way to technical meetings. It's not meant to define data, but rather to define what each term means in a business sense. What do we mean by customer, sale conversion rate, credit, GPA? These types of questions can be answered with a business glossary. It defines the business concepts for an organization or an industry, and these concepts tend to be independent from any specific database or vendor. And I think we are used with business glossaries in general as we tend to find them in documents, contract systems, spreadsheets, books, manuals, and so on. And this is sort of it's really the basic of the basic of the structures. You have something like a term name, a per layout plan, for example, and then it's definition, right? That, that's kind of it. But within the data governance domain, I think it's a bit more than that. And I do think that business glossary is really that gift that keeps on giving. And let me tell you why. And it's easier to tell you why if I show you an example, and I'll show you an example from a data Edo's business glossary here. So it doesn't just have the term name and its definition. And by the way, this is not the best definition, but I'm just trying to prove a point here that it's much more than this. It includes all these other attributes, it includes an, a hierarchy, gives you some sort of a categorization, gives you uh, its synonym, um, its status, who its data steward is, data owner, and a bunch of other attributes that you can add as well. There are maybe about 10 or so foundational ones that I recommend, but I've seen organizations that have up to 90 different attributes 
not all required, of course, but yes, 90, maybe it's a bit much. Um, but it, it does offer uh, just a load, a treasure of information that is very useful for the business to have access to. Of course, you can have relationships to other business terms and sometimes even link to data elements in a data dictionary. And we'll, we'll see an example in the data dictionary from the data dictionary point of view. So there are a lot of benefits and reasons why an organization should invest in a business glossary. Again, we all come with those assumptions based on our life and work experience and inadvertently bring them into the workplace without always validating them. Like I was in my example with the, the job interview there. So I think one of the, the main benefits of the business glossary is that it does enable consistent communications between business units. And the term customer is a perfect example of this because most of the time it doesn't mean the same thing for procurement as it does for uh, supply chain management, as it does for sales, marketing, IT department, employee, student, alumnus, uh, patient, all these words that are quite common and a natural part of our vocabulary can actually have different definitions between business units. And I think there are plenty, plenty of examples out there. Uh, for, and a patient, I think, is one of them, right? Let's not even worry about the different medical units, the different types of patients, but what if somebody comes in for medical attention at the clinic and they're not being helped yet? While they're waiting, are they considered patients? Are they losing their patience? Um, that was a silly attempt at a joke, I think. So, I mean, there are usually metrics on patient wait times. So maybe, yes, maybe they're considered patients. What about those being treated that don't have any paperwork, nor do they exist in the system, but they are being treated, right? Are they being patients? So besides this, I think it's also about communicating with uh, the outside of a given organization. And Henry Gabs, uh, uh, Lilian Dahl, and sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, he was mentioning that using the same terms for the same things is hard enough inside a given organization, but it doesn't stop there, right? With the rise of digital transformation, we and our machines will increasingly communicate with business partners in the business ecosystem. And we must strive to use the same glossary or at least know how different glossaries map with each other. And this starts with having your own business glossary. It also establishes that ownership. Again, inevitably, I think ownership is usually established when, when a glossary is being built. Right, it's one of those wanted side effects, I think, of starting a business glossary. And what happens is somebody needs to give that stamp of approval when a term is being defined, right? It might be an individual most of the time, like the um, director of a department, or it could be, um, you know, a C-level executive or a committee of council for terms such as customer, which are organization wide. And that committee or council that would usually be a data governance committee or data governance council, however you wanna call it. And why this is great is because it doesn't just stop here. It doesn't stop with the, bit, the term itself definition at the business glossary level. It really spreads into other data governance areas. It spreads into having ownership of the, over those data quality metrics. It spreads into anything that has to do with that term in defining new processes or a piece of software or report. Um, it, it spreads into assigning and determining who the data stewards should be. It's really a great benefit, I think. And another benefit is um, that improvement of productivity. Again, why it does take a long time and a lot of people to get involved to get um, consensus on these definitions, especially when they're organization-wide, such as customer. And after all this time, usually it's around um, probably development of a report most of the time, but it could be a piece of software, a new ERP, CMS system, CRM that's being implemented or transitioned into. And after all this time, so after all these meetings, at best, I think, 
the documentation of who owns it, what the definition is, resides in a document somewhere on an intranet or in an email. And that's fine, but then a year after when you need to create another report similar to it and you have a new program where on board, you have a new analyst on board, even a new head of the department, you kind of need to go through that exercise again. But if you were to have a business glossary, you will just refer to it and use that definition. It really saves a lot of time. And I do encourage you, by the way, there are a lot more definite, uh, sorry, there are a lot more benefits. Um, and there's another webinar on demand that they, they tell you to host it. I think it's called the business glossary is the what, the, the how, and the why, or the what, the why, and the how, uh, where I do cover a few more benefits. So do watch that one. All right, I do want to mention, this is not part of the trifecta, but I do want to mention what the difference between a business dictionary and a glossary is. So um, the easiest way to show you is we actually pull a dictionary such as the Merriam-Webster, but of course any other dictionary would work. And I've typed in the noun report here. So what becomes apparent right away is that for the noun report for one word, we have all these definitions, right? We have three main meanings, but in total there's um, six definitions. Whereas with a glossary, we would only have one, one unique term and its definition. So remember from the definition of the glossary, there were three keywords, business, information, and unique. The main takeaway is that a business dictionary can have multiple uh, definitions for the same term, which I think it can be confusing because one would always need to figure out what the context is and obviously issues, errors would occur because of it. And the business glossary has one unique term and its definition, one definition. Okay, so hopefully now we have a better understanding of what a business glossary is. Let's see what a data dictionary is. It really is a repository of information about data that provides a description of a data element and its metadata. And again, it's easier if we do to take a look at an example here. So it provides all these specifications. Uh, first, you can start at the, the table level, gives you some metadata description, but then more importantly, I think, it provides you all these specifications for each column, each field in the table. It provides us with um, information such as the data type and the size, sometimes allowed values, default values, relations to other data elements, and uh, sometimes even the, the meaning and purpose of each of the fields. Let, let me just make this smaller. So, um, Again, it gives you all these uh, character, uh, date, integer, and so on, data types, describe some of the constraints, such as the alphanumeric character limit, what date format it has, if it's required, if it's nullable, if it's unique, if it has a primary key or a foreign key, a lot of useful technical metadata. And I think what you need to remember is that a data dictionary provides a very application technology centric view of the data. It provides the description of a data element and its metadata. Something else that I want you to remember is that you can have many data dictionaries within one organization, usually one for each application or system or database. And that being said, a business glossary and a data dictionary are usually connected and they reference each other as we've seen from the business glossary example, and we can also see here from the data dictionary point of view, the uh, the depth field, uh, depth column, uh, with I think this is the alias of code, links to the uh, business glossary entry for department. Just one example. So obviously there are a lot of benefits here as well. I think the first one is that if you think about it, whenever developers need to program anything that has to do with capturing or consuming data, such as a web form or a piece of software or report, it's very useful to understand the technical metadata behind the data elements, right? If you're developing a web form to capture the customer name, you should know what technical metadata should be used so it doesn't have any unwanted repercussions. So maybe you design it to have a varchar field of 
32 characters. But if your database is storing it at a varchar field of 16 characters, you will run into issues. And I think this is forcing the programmer to kind of raise this or ask these questions from the business analyst or technical analyst if they haven't thought about it themselves. It really um, forces them, hopefully, to communicate. This um, um, expedite training of new and existing employees, this benefit, I do think it applies to each one of the three artifacts, the data catalog, data dictionary, and business glossary but in the context of the data dictionary. I think you can ask any developer who recently joined a company. That the hard part about learning their new stack wasn't really deciphering the code itself. It was bringing context to it. And there's a reason why it can take several months for any new technical hire to be fully ramped on their new uh, company CRM, ERP, CMS, what have you, even if though they might have worked with it before at a different company. Database documentation is critical in getting your technical and often more costly employees up to speed quickly on the application they're building or the architecture of your system. And I do uh, dare to say that it does improve master data management. It really supports it. And I think this is especially true when handling the integration of databases that don't share the same vocabulary, but do share similar data, such as when inheriting the CRM or database of a company during an acquisition or a merger. But not only, anything that has to do with master data, this helps. I'll be the first to admit that documentation is a pain and often the last part of the process that anyone wants to be responsible for. But any well-documented organization will tell you that this investment is well worth the long-term efficiencies around faster development and data integration, especially around master data. And I'm not sure if uh, Scott Taylor is, has joined this uh, session yet, but I do recommend watching him and um, follow him on LinkedIn and YouTube channel for any topic on master data. He's quite the expert. He's a data whisperer. So now we know business glossary, data dictionary. Let's see the last piece of the trifecta, the data catalog. I think the, the easiest way to maybe understand its purpose is to think back to those days of those product catalogs. I don't know if anybody remembers the old Macy's catalog, but I think a lot of stores kind of had this as well, right? You had a, this catalog that would you would browse through for clothes and cooking items, food and other stuff and you put in the order and a few weeks or months later, your product would arrive at the store or at your home. And nowadays we have something similar, but maybe a lot more improved. It's the catalog 2.0, right? It's something like amazon.com. Now Amazon carries millions of different products and yet consumers, as consumers, we can find almost anything fairly quickly, right? I typed in moving um, and I was looking for a book on, on moving abroad, working abroad, uh, managing my finances and so on, whatever I need to know. And it helped me find this product. And be, besides this, besides the search functionality, it really gives you a bunch of information about it. All these reviews that you have access to, different maybe types of the same uh, product, different versions. And sometimes it gives you uh, recommended products based on my um, previous searches or what other users, purchasers found it to be useful, and all these other metadata, all the way from uh, you know its, its weight um, to even instructional videos, seller's information, shipping times, what have you. And data catalogs work in the same way for your databases, but they can also be used for data lakes or data warehouses, any data stores, really. So a data catalog is an enterprise-wide asset providing a single reference source for the location of any data set required for varying needs, such as operational, BI, analytics, data science, AI, what have you. The purpose of the data catalogs is to organize the thousands or millions of an organization's data sets to help users perform searches for specific data and understand its metadata, sometimes even data lineage and uses, and even how others perceive the data's value. This single point directory offers the user the ability to locate information and further provides the mapping between the business glossary 
and the data dictionary. And I think if you want a good example, you can look at any open data that you can find out there. And this is one from uh, data.gov. And actually, uh, I think we still have time. Let me just pull this really quickly here so I can show you. Um, obviously, you can just search for it or you can just browse based on different metadata and categories. But let's just go on the data tab here. Uh, let's see, uh, socioeconomic indicators. All of a sudden, you can see that it's giving us a bit of a description. Uh, it's giving us uh, uh, the links to the data sets themselves, which can be, uh, be actually acquired from, in this case, from different departments, different uh, federal institutions. Um, in your own organization, will probably be from different departments. And then you also see all this additional metadata about it. Um, such as the, you know, the maintainer contact information, that'll be the data steward probably. Um, then it has a data dictionary linked to it. Um, though, again, what adds to the confusion, let's, let's look at it. The data dictionary here is not really a data dictionary. It's just providing a, a bit more context into each one of the uh, data assets that the catalog is holding. So sometimes it's giving us a bit more indicator on the data quality, such as the completeness factor here. Um, yeah, but this is actually, let's see, the schema. This is a bit more like the data dictionary, right? It's telling us in the data sets that we want to download, what are the, the different fields, their um, technical metadata and some descriptions as well. And there's a throw of information here. So it, it, obviously this comes from a available data dictionary, but it's just surfaced or referenced by the data catalog. Okay, so this is really a quick one minute overview over a data catalog example. So, again, a lot of benefits with the data catalog, of course. It does support regulatory compliance, I, I, I dare to say. Why is because normally if you have this implemented, it prevails throughout your organization. Um, if you look for customer data, it would let you know in what systems, what databases, what data views you would find customer data. And of course, if you went through a data classification exercise, then, then you might know that customer data would hold um, highly risk information or just very highly risk information, depending on what you're storing and what type of customers you have. So it helps. It helps. It's, it's again, one of those unwanted benefits. But more importantly, I think it facilitates that frictionless discoverability. It's fostering the user enthusiasm needed for a robust data culture. Data catalogs help users find the data they want and discover data that they might not even known that was available, right? So, and sometimes even uh, machine learning recommendations can help users as well, especially when they're based on what other users have found useful. And you can find this with some of the open data catalogs. There's different rating systems that uh, their users would be able to provide to them or different comments, votings. Uh, you can have different met metrics such as how many times it was used in the last month or altogether. It also increases trust of data because the data sets that are added to this catalog, most of the time, they are curated. So similar to the artworks displayed in a museum, right? They're being uh, clean and described. You get that little plaque and then they're being posted to be enjoyed to be used by the audience. And similar to these data sets that are found in the data catalog. You know, as a data analyst, you would go there, uh, look for customers, see what else is available, maybe something that you haven't even thought about. And you know, um, somebody went through it, uh, that when you are checking out that data set, you can trust it. And if not, at least, you know, you can have the uh, data steward's contact information to ask more question, um, to to inquire more about their data quality and, um, different other metrics that you might be interested about. Okay, 
So let's see what their relationship is. And I think we've, we've teased some of this already. So as we've discussed, obviously the data from databases comes into the data dictionary. Sometimes um, for an active data dictionary, it might go both ways. But most of the time, your data dictionaries would be passive, meaning that if, if something does change, you would update that yourself in the data dictionary. Whereas, again, with an active data dictionary, you're updating it in a data dictionary, and that is reflected in the database, and that's mostly used by administrators. Okay. Now, as we've seen from the data catalog example, the data, the technical metadata, that useful information is surfaced or at least referenced in a data catalog as well. And uh, same with the business glossary, though, depending on what software you're using, it can go both ways. They can reference each other out. And lastly, of course, the, the business glossary is also referenced in a data catalog. So when we're looking at a customer data, we can see that definition or at least a link towards where we can access that definition of what a customer is. Okay, so hopefully now you do have a better idea of what a business glossary, a data dictionary, and a data catalog is. I think remember that ideally you should only have one business glossary. You can have multiple data dictionaries as long as there is one per system or database and one data catalog per organization to kind of tie it all together. I do have to say that typically organizations start either with a data dictionary because of a new system integration or migration project or with a business glossary because of a BI program or project or even with both at the same time for a data analytics or AI project. And then the data catalog would uh, most reasonably be developed after the successful creation of both the business glossary and the data dictionaries, but it can also be assembled incrementally as the other two assets evolve over time. And because of the mapping work required um, and requires involvement from both business and technical expertise, assembling the data catalog is a collaborative effort between the business and the IT folks. So now I do hope you have a better understanding of what the differences are between the three artifacts and you'll be able to implement all three and navigate this ocean of data a lot better. So thank you, and don't forget to get in touch with me and connect with me on LinkedIn. I always enjoy meeting new people and persons on, uh, online or in person and listening to your feedback and sharing ideas and information. So thank you, and uh, off to you, Pietro. Thank you, George. That was very, very useful. We already had some feedback from the users. Uh, before we go to uh, the questions, uh, I'd like to take a minute and mention the data Edo software. Now, George already showed you um, uh, some basic functionalities. Let me give you a, an overview and then we can move to the questions. Let me share my screen. Okay, so what we have right now on the screen is a, um, a data Edo uh, data catalog, uh, or you can think about this as a database documentation tool. Uh, it, it scans your uh, databases and extracts uh, the data dictionary. This is something that was covered by George uh, on this webinar. So we, we scan all those information for uh, sharing. You can uh, describe every, every asset uh, with the descriptions, uh, classifications, uh, information about owners, uh, stewards, uh, the status, and so on. Um, we also allow to you to build a business glossary. This was also shown by, by George. And what is uh, especially valuable, you can map business glossary with data dictionary. So uh, this department term uh, that exists in a glossary is mapped to the uh, specific asset, specific table in a system. Uh, you can have multiple data sources and you can map them all, them all to this, uh, this asset. Uh, you can navigate through the entire catalog. Mm, you can search. Uh, so let's search for customer. Mm, right. And also you can visualize, uh, you can visualize the, the data relationships in an ER diagram. Right, let's see some other example. Um, yeah. 
Um, yeah. We also help you find uh, sensitive information and classify it. Uh, <clears throat> You've seen uh, some. Uh, you can classify uh, the the physical assets, and you can classify the business terms. So you can uh, assign, like in this example, GDPR classification. You can assign a sensitivity level. Uh, you can have multiple uh, classifications, and we help you scan the entire sources to uh, uh, to find find those those uh, those data fields. I would like to talk uh, more about this. If you are interested, uh, you can do two things. You can join our uh, demo webinar, which will be hosted on uh, in two weeks on Wednesday, same time. You can also join my maybe webinar next uh, week on Wednesday, uh, specifically about building data dictionary. Mm. You can also uh, give it a try, and it's a very simple tool to get started. You just install, uh, scan your sources, and you're ready to, to share it with your with your team. So you can uh, get a free 30-day trial. If that's not enough, you can uh, contact us, and we can uh, we can extend the, the trial so you can have a look at the software and actually get all the benefits from data catalog that George mentioned uh, previously. Okay, so that, that's it. Uh, uh, let's go into questions now. Um, so I'll start with the, the, the oldest one. So um, Julia had a comment uh, when you asked about the different uh, other names that exist in the space. So she mentioned uh, BI catalog or index as well. So oh, BI interesting. Catalog. And I would assume that the BI catalog would refer to a set of reports and dashboards that the organization has and, and provides services for. But I, I might be wrong. But yeah, thank you I, for I th plugging that. I think, I think you're right. And the uh, data catalogs, some, some data catalogs, to my knowledge at least, they also catalog some other uh, data assets like reports, also not only data and business goals, search, but also reports. We are planning to add this functionality in uh, some future so definitely the, 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 the scope of metadata expands over time. Okay, let's move on. Um, and something I else I, I want to mention about that is um, certain data catalogs, and you, you'll see this a lot with the open data, uh, the way they're surfaced, they do provide a quick visualization tool as well, so you can inspect the data before you're utilizing it and it provides um, even some dashboards and summaries of that data in graphical format. Um, we have uh, two more comments rather than questions from uh, James. Um, when you were talking about the business uh, dictionary versus glossary, uh, James said, what I have been calling a glossary is actually, actually a dictionary. Thanks for pointing out the distinction. Mm, I practice in practice, I don't think you can insist on the term uniqueness. So I'll be using dictionaries rather than glossaries from now on. That's something you can comment on, actually. Yeah, and I, um, what, I, what I can add to that is, I mean, it all depends. And you're right, it is a challenge, especially with you know, white terms like customer. Um, and there are two ways about it. Either you use some sort of a categorization to then determine, okay, what customer are we referring to, right? And you might use a categorization based on um, departments or some sort of a hierarchy. Or you can change the term of customer and say um, supply chain customer or um, marketing customer. You get the idea, but just a way to differentiate um, between the two. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I would definitely, uh, as an organization, agree on the unique names. So uh, just to, for the sake of uh, avoiding confusion, right? Why use the same term in different meanings? Yeah, and the truth is, I mean, in the natural language where you're talking to your colleagues and everything, you might actually just refer, you just say customer. You wouldn't say supply chain customer. Uh, but then uh, you would reference the the proper definition for it, like the supply chain customer definition or a link to it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when you're writing a requirements document, uh, you you don't want to, you know, get wrong assumptions, right? You want Correct. to have a very specific. Okay, James has another comment. Uh, when you were talking about the um, data dictionary, that's, a, that's an interesting one. So that was a, 
a very technical data dictionary, a, a more business focused data dictionary, ignoring technical details like varchar or uh, as a type uh, rather than text is also very useful. For sure. I mean, its main audience would be IT, though obviously um, BA technical analysts would have access to it as well. Uh, but usually that uh, description that you have for each one of the fields and tables is a bit more business focused, I guess, or it tries to bring in some business context to the uh, technical details. And of course, it can be linked to the business glossary as well, which is solely business focused. What I could add to this mm -hmm. is that data dictionary actually is a, is a very quite generic term. Uh, it could be a technical data dictionary, as James pointed out, where uh, where it it's a definition of a physical data, like in a file or in a table in a database. But data dictionary, in my opinion, this is something that you could use as a modeling tool. So uh, you can you know use it as a definition of data that is not physically stored. That way, you you could use you should use uh, very generic types like text or date. You don't need to go into the technical details. So data dictionary can mean different things depending on the context. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. maybe you should actually, uh, yeah, as a good example of business glossary, maybe you should give them different names, right? Okay, uh, let's move on. Laura asks, um, how do you define metadata, technical metadata and business metadata? Well, it's just that data about data, right? So it's the description and context of the data. It's providing us um, any information about one or more aspects of the data. So in terms of the technical stuff, it provides us technical details. Like again, what a developer would need to know. And the business uh, metadata is again, you know, who's that data steward? What's its definition? Uh, what's a synonym, acronym? Uh, things that a, a business user would access and use. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, Piotr? Uh, yeah, I, will, I would define technical metadata as something that represents uh, information systems, uh, like a, already not, not, a, uh, not a specification of a system, but like a documentation. So a list of reports, list of tables, uh, and this kind of thing. So yeah, that's, that's my view. OK, uh, another question mm, from Warwick. Uh, it seems uh, to me that all three can be stored in one place, but the difference between the three is how the metadata is accessed. Do you agree? Um, maybe. Um, I mean, you can probably store them in, in the same at the same database level, for example. Normally, they're surfaced a bit differently. So maybe there is a software out there that would provide all three functionalities, let's say, but normally they have uh, maybe three different views as it's servicing different purposes. Mm -hmm. My view would be that data catalog is a software while business glossary and data dictionary are assets, like so something that could be inside the software. That's okay. Let's move on to the next one. Utsaf ask, I am trying to create a data dictionary for my company and using data to help me communicate this. One of the ways I was trying to upload my data was through flat, field, flat files. Okay, that was actually not a question. Uh, uh, okay, I'm not sure if that's a question, but yeah, you can... Uh, um, the, the data dictionary and data catalog, um, actually catalogs that are on the market right now, they f f support different uh, types of uh, data assets. So some of them focus on relational data. Uh, this is where we come from. So the relational databases, some of them ha have support for no SQL data, like uh, JSON files or no, this kind of thing. And some other also come from the data lake, lake uh, environments where they try to catalog files in a data lake, flat files. So you can uh, catalog all kinds of data you have. I believe in the future, there will be uh, unstructured uh, data catalogs. Uh, 
Uh, I I don't not not aware if there's any at the moment, but yeah. So uh, let's move on. Um, uh, Gianluca, uh, hi. At what level, data addiction or business terms, sh should data quality procedure be applied? Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, and I'm not quite sure I, I fully understand it. Um, I mean, data quality procedures should be applied outside of these artifacts, right? But you can surface the data quality level. So sometimes the data dictionary or even the, the business glossary can integrate with the data quality tool to then tell you what the state of quality on different metrics is for that term or for that table for that field. I'm not sure if this answers your questions. Please do follow up if it doesn't. Yeah, please ask another question if you'd like a, a clarification. Um, a technical question about the webinar. At Utsaf ask, will you receive a email to those three webinars I mentioned? Um, I hope so. I'm not quite sure. If you'd like to uh, visit, you can uh, go to the main page of this uh, this window you have right now. Mm, so it's app.livestorm.co slash dataido and there are the webinars. I will try to uh, send the invites after the meeting uh, to everybody. Okay, let's let's move. We have a couple of more questions. Um, uh, Ambrish asks, what are the, the some key details which can be or should be captured as part of data catalog only and not in data dictionary? Data, That's a good okay. question. So I think the, the, the one that comes to mind is that user interaction with the data. And that is captured in a data catalog. So you can see not only who used it, what it was you know, checked out for, who it was checked out for, uh, but uh, again, what, what feedback they have about it, what comments do they have, what sort of rating um, they, they provide back about the data uh, sets that they're using. And to add to that, sometimes the data catalog is surfacing data in a way that is not exactly um, in the same way in the database. So you can just reference a view, for example, compiling you know three different data dictionaries or three different databases into one to serve a specific purpose for a data analyst. Okay, let's uh, jump to the next question. Um, uh, what would be the, the what would be an ideal way to maintain a data dictionary centrally or multiple? Yeah, that's. It, it kind of depends on your operation model, the size of the organization, how many systems you have. Um, so you can, and sometimes you can be a hybrid as well. Um, if your Maintaining this centrally, it might be a bit easier, right? Because you do have that consistency. You have a central support system that any of these requests can go through, but it can also be a bottleneck. At the same time, if you enable this to different departments to be able to do what they wish, it can be chaos if you don't have some sort of a version control. So that then needs to be a requirement. Or you might have uh, different, let's say, departments have access to parts of the data dictionary or, or parts of different tables that they would have then ownership with. And so they would only maintain part of that data dictionary and not all of it. Um, I would add that uh, we, our tool, uh, manages and maintains the data dictionary on the data source level. Uh, so from a technical point of view. So just sync it with specific connection. Okay, let's move on. As uh, BigF asks, for whom and how to cal calculate the return on investment in a data dictionary, business glossary, or data catalog? That's, well, there, that's there a are a lot of metrics uh, and we won't have time to go over them, but I can tell you that there is actually quite a few surveys done out there with different organizations. Um, and there's one from Accenture, I think that was done a couple of years ago. And they were trying to estimate based on these surveys, how much time is being wasted on trying to find information on, um, you know, technical or business metadata. 
and it ends up that it's quite a quite a few hours. I think it was nine point five hours a week uh, that were spent by an information worker. They call it or somebody working with data, trying to search the information that they needed to in order to uh, do their jobs. So starting from there, you can you can try and gauge you know how many hours are being wasted just searching for the same information. Um, that probably um, the same amount of time is also being wasted by another person looking for the same thing, probably going through the same steps, not having this centralized curated place where they can find all of this, you know, a data dictionary, data catalog, a business glossary, whatever the, their need would be. So I think that's a, a great metric to start from to see how much time you would save and in return based on the salary you can also estimate um, some sort of a cost benefit that you will gain from it. Um, okay, we, uh, we are running uh, quite uh, above the time limit and there are new qu questions coming in. So let me ask a la one last question and I will send the remaining ones uh, to George and he'll try to answer them uh, over email. Okay, uh, one last question from Amr. What is a good starting point to build a business glossary? I do encourage you to one. watch the other webinar yeah. as well as it's addressing this in as greater detail, but as with any project, you should definitely get that buy-in first. And, but let's say you do get the buy-in, I think it's uh, better to focus on a specific department or a specific business area um, as you get more um, bang for the buck, I think is the expression. So you would definitely get a lot more value uh, they're, they're a bit more tailored. You do need to engage less people and get consensus from, and you will start uh, seeing that value a lot quicker than if you're chasing something like you know, customer. But do start with just a spreadsheet, um, start engaging with stakeholders. A lot of this information does live in their head. They do have an idea of what each one of the terms that they have a jurisdiction over and expertise over what they mean. And it's probably recorded somewhere or again in their head. Start recording in a spreadsheet. Again, follow best practices. Um, there's there's a lot. There's a lot to talk about. I do teach a course about it, so I can't just answer this question in one minute. Um, but yes, start with the buy-in and, and then um, start chasing people for information. Just go for one specific business area to start. Okay. That was the last question. I'm sorry to everybody whose answers are not uh, questions are not answered. Uh, we will try to do it after uh, over email. Thank you, George, very much. It's it was very very interesting, very insightful. Um, thank you all for joining. We will send out uh, links to other webinars you should that you should check out too. And thank you for joining. Thank, thank you, George. You. Have a nice day.